Hello! This video is on Chaucer's Contemporaries. We have already talked about Chaucer. I have told you that he came at a time when Renaissance was flourishing. Chaucer was not the only brilliant writer at that time. There were quite a few brilliant writers at the end of the medieval period. Ah, you already know about them. William Langland, John Gower, John Wycliffe. Let us talk about them in detail. William Langland is associated with the text, The Vision of Pius the Plowman. <laughs> the interesting thing is, we don't know anything about William Langland. Did he really live? Is it one person who wrote via Vision of Pius the Plowman? No idea. One thing we know, the Vision of Pius the Plowman is written by some will because that is the narrator, the dreamer. This is a dream allegory. He is dreaming, sleeping and dreaming, waking up and telling what he dreamt, again falling asleep, again waking up. <laughs> Series of dream visions. This is how Vision of Pius the Plowman is written. This is an amazing text which is considered a major historical document. So many people must have written copies, so many scribes must have made copies because 50 manuscripts have come down to us, 50 manuscripts. Three versions, A, B, C text. And these manuscripts show the text as divided into two sections, Visio and Vita. Visio means vision, Vita means life. You know, alliteration was a very important feature of old English literature. Alliteration, repetition of consonant sounds. Old English literature is over, old English period is over, middle English period. Now this is the end of the middle English period. At this time, there was a revival of alliteration. This is called the movement called Great Alliterative Revival. And our Pius the Plowman is a very important text of the Great Alliterative Revival. Another medieval text that is part of this movement is Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. You must know about it as well. Now you are wondering what is Visio and Vita? Mahuna, I will tell you. The series of dream visions talks about Will, the dreamer, sleeping and dreaming and he's meeting Pius the Plowman. The story begins on Malvern Hills. On Malvern Hills, the dreamer is dreaming and seeing his first vision. He's looking down from Malvern Hills. On one side, he's seeing a tower, the tower of truth. And on the other side, the dungeon of wrong. In between is a field full of folk, people, you and me, people, us. The story is about these people. These series of dream visions, you will think, are all disconnected, one dream after the other. It's like that when we dream. You know what I do? I, I can't go back to sleep after I wake up in between. Can you? I start dreaming and uh, <laughs> I, try, I sometimes wake up in between. If somebody is there waking me up, I tell them, please don't wake me. I'm continue, let me continue my dream. It was a beautiful dream. Don't wake me. I say like that. Because dreams, every time you dream, they are different. Not in Pius the Plowman. There is a remarkable unity in Pius the Plowman. The dream is like continuing. That is a very great narrative technique that he is using. Such an ancient writer, isn't it? But still, wonderful narrative technique. And you will be amazed to know really. Because this book is a combination of realism and allegory. Political comment is there. Religious comments are there. A mix of everything. It's a rich text. An amazing text. And in Vision of Pius the Plowman, apart from Pius the Plowman, you are wondering, are there any other characters? Yes. Three important characters are there. Do well, do bet and do best. Do well, do bet, do better. That is the meaning. Do best. At the end of the 
story, Pius's actions become indistinguishable with that of Christ. Pius is like Christ. This is all about Pius the Plowman. Are you ready to hear about John Gower? He was an aristocrat, the most famous contemporary of Chaucer. He was almost like an unofficial poet laureate. No wonder when Chaucer wrote Troilus and Cressid, he dedicated it to O oh, Moral Gower. Dedicating it to the powerful, rich, you know, aristocrat means something. That means uh, my text is good. It is dedicated to a very famous man. He is the reader. That is the meaning. Chaucer knew some marketing and promotion. John Gower was very didactic, moralistic. That's why, oh, moral Gower. And Gower first wrote a French work because French, as you know, was the aristocratic language. Speculum meditandus means the mirror of one meditating. Written in the manner of a French allegory, it gives a very truthful picture of 14th century society. One book in French, second book in Latin, Vox Clementis. Being Latin, it must be about religion and clergy, we know. But here, he satirizes the clergy. And you know, it was the king who said, Are John Gower, you write something in our language, English. On the insistence of Richard II, John Gower wrote, Confessio Amantis. Confession of a lover. There's a conversation between the poet lover and Venus. And then there is a confession made to Venus's deputy genius. Remember the characters, it could be important in exams. And Confessio Amantis is written about love, which is not a very great theme. Great languages, French and Latin, were used to write about great things like religion. English is cheap language at that time. English is the suitable language for a book on love. It is not didactic. That is why today we consider it his greatest text. You know what is happening in Confessio Amandis? He is actually telling the stories of seven deadly sins. So you know, the subtitle of Confessio Amandis is Tales of Seven Deadly Sins. Now, let me ask you a question. In which play by Shakespeare is John Gower coming as the chorus? Post in comments, I won't tell you. In which play by Shakespeare is John Gower the chorus? He's a character. And the play also is drawn from Confessio Amantis. Did you post in comment section? Now, the next writer that I want to talk to you about, Chaucer's contemporary, is John Wycliffe. Wycliffe, that is how his name was pronounced before the great vowel shift. Very big change happened in pronunciation, you know that? John Wycliffe or Wycliffe is most remembered for what? His translation of the Bible. And he was a leader of the Lollards. Lollards are poor priests. You know, in those days, high priest and poor priest, very big difference. High priest had everything, luxury, food, rest. Low priests had to tell their rosaries. They are tired because of no proper food. And they lolled their heads like this in sleep. They were called the Lollards. And... John Wycliffe, by becoming the leader of the Lollards, initiated Reformation. John Wycliffe is called the Morning Star of Reformation. There was another poet also, Pearl Poet. We don't know his name. He is the author of the Middle English poem, Pearl. Pearl, Purity, Patience, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, all are by the Pearl Poets. These are the amazing writers of the Middle English period. There were also other writers, we don't know them. <laughs> Their works we know. Owl and the Nightingale. And Crane Rule. Have you heard of that? 
it is a book of rules for anchoresses anchoress is a clerical profession clerical matlab uh, clergy that clerical so so many medieval works were there historical literary religious secular everything but above all of them soared the eagle who is the eagle jeffrey chaucer so did you like this video guys please tell me in the comment section any points that i have missed any new information that you will have questions that you want me to answer any doubts you may have be in touch with me read extra okay guys bye bye until the next video